Welcome to Gold Derby. I'm senior editor Denton Davidson here with Alan Hughes, the director of Dear Mama, which follows the life and legacy of Tupac Shakur and his mother, the Black Panther activist, Afini Shakur. You begin this documentary with an interview where Tupac compares himself to Job in the Bible, and he's done a lot of interviews. Uh, what stood out to you about that one in particular, and, and why did you want to begin the film with, with that glimpse of him? I think Tupac was born into um, a struggle, the struggle, you know, his mother being a Black Panther. I discovered along the way also he's born into a tremendous amount of uh, trauma, inherited trauma um, from his mother and and the movement. And I think that he was aware that he was being tested. Uh, his character was being tested. So that's why we opened it uh, with those remarks from him. And um, um, that was it. And this is really a story about Tupac and his mother, Afini, uh, who has more of her own legacy than some people might realize. Some of her history was certainly new to me. Why did you want to do this documentary now? And why through the lens of his relationship with his mom? Because I can relate to being, I can relate to being raised by a single mother, one, in poverty, two, and my mother was also an activist in the women's rights movement. So I felt I could discover Tupac's journey through his mother's journey. Uh, there's this saying, the sins of the father will visit the son or whatever the saying is. I, what about the actions and thoughts of the, the single mother and her children? And I know how my mother's activism, radical activism uh, affected uh, my brother and I. And I think Afeni's story was just a fresh uh, a revelation as well. A lot of women get erased from history, especially women of color. And we discovered along the way, there was a lot of stuff that she was actively involved in, um, in the Panther movement. And even when she went to trial, the famous Panther 21 case, um, defending herself, which was a bold decision. A lot of this stuff has been erased from the history books and I just was not aware of. So it was quite the revelation for this narrative. And you had a personal relationship with Tupac, not always a pleasant one. That might that might be an understatement. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk about that a little bit? And why did you feel like now you would be the right person to tell this story? Well, my brother and I, we started our careers with Tupac. His first three music videos were some of our first few music videos that we did. We did three off his debut album, Tupacalypse Now. We all were 19, I think very passionate. Um, very uh, volatile um, and that's why we got along so well and um, he was meant to be a supporting role in our first film Menace to Society in fact him signing on to our first film was the reason why it got greenlit and the relationship had just gotten so volatile that it, it was hard to maintain it in pre-production so we had to let him go and that became uh, quite controversial because it got physical later um, but you know I think for me, uh, a lot of this has to do with like men now, you'll see Snoop Dogg in the film who was very close to Tupac, a 50 year old man now able to reflect back on the thoughts, actions and mishaps of boys. You know, we were all boys. So uh, my heart is big and I wanna understand uh, things. I'm not coming in trying to judge anything, just exploring all these things that happened to us, um, young filmmakers, young artists and and um, take a tremendous amount of pride. And also, you know, we were some of Tupac's first image makers. So to come back and complete that journey and find the meaning and purpose in his journey, especially his mother through his mother was uh, meaningful for me. You mentioned Snoop, you have a lot of great interviews, but I fell in love with Aunt Glo. I, yeah. she, she was my favorite. Uh, just her stories, the way she speaks and her humor, uh, what was it like to speak with her and what, and learn from her? What was your moments with her like? People always ask, like, what, how do you tell a great story? I say, start with great characters. And when you meet like so-called civilians, people who are not performers, um, Tupac's aunt, uh, Glow, her name is Gloria, but we call her Glow. Tupac gave her that nickname Glow, and I think it's appropriate because she is just, she's just a great natural storyteller. She has a gift for it. Um, she reminds me of like, Richard Pryor coupled with some blues man. Um, and there's a bit of mysticism there too. So, you know, she's a Feeney's only sister and Tupac's only aunt um, for her to be here in her seventies and step up like that. She was not that in her family. When a Feeney was here and Tupac was here, she played the background, but to see her move into that position and meet the moment with um, poise and humor and 
you know, um, sometimes darkness, but always multidimensional and very complex um, and very spiritual. And it's just so important to have someone that's a real human being that can actually just black out and just tell the story. She was wonderful. What was the biggest challenge through the process um, in terms of getting to tell the story that you want? I mean, was the did, did the estates have disagreements with you on, on how things were portrayed or were you guys pretty in unison? Well, the state de definitely had challenges that there were certain things that they didn't agree with, but everything was a conversation, you know, because they did grant us access to all the writings, the poetry, the music, the multi-tracks. It's really important for me as a filmmaker to have access to the multi-tracks because I tend to strip them down and score a bit with them and also take the acapella um, and have, you know, my wonderful composers, Atticus, Claudia, and Leo, um, hearing Tupac's lyrics to the compositions uh, brings us closer to him. I have a rule in the editing room, if grandma, can't under if grandma don't understand it, it's gotta go. So I had to make sure that even this hip hop stuff that our average grandmother would understand what he was saying. And Afani as well, she, there was some spoken word poetry from the early seventies when she got off that case, the Panther 21 trial. And she was out there um, um, touring and lecturing. And you see, she was a poet first and she was a, a, a wordsmith first and a spoken, spoken word poet as well. Um, and you see where he got the power of words and story from and uh, from his mother. But yeah, it was, it was a challenge working with the, the estate, but they were not the toughest. They were not the toughest part. The toughest part was there's so many different friends and family and anyone that knew Tupac felt like they, they owned Tupac. If, if, there, if there was someone that went to Disneyland with him one day in the 90s, they're writing a book about it. It's, the, it's like the most important thing that happened to him. So that was difficult trying to bring so many disparate family members and friends together because they're outside of the family. There's a lot of fracturing there with the friends and, and loved ones. There's also so many different sides of Tupac that someone could have known a totally different Tupac. One of the, I, I love the, the videos of him when he's young, especially like in high school. He's like a kid in drama class. Uh, he's not a gangster. And then this evolution, and, and there's even people in the documentary that talk about he could go to a country club or the ghetto and fit in wherever he is. What, what was your experience like in, in seeing that about him and the energy that he would bring to any room that he was in? I mean, first and foremost, uh, what I knew then, I felt then, I know now is that he's an artist first, before actor, before recording artist, he is wired as an artist and has all the delusions that an artist has, the wonderful alternate reality that artists live in. He doesn't see the world the way uh, so-called normal people see the world. He's not seeing it the way you see it. And I think it's incredibly inspiring for I, th I think the youth to see that he's actually not a, he, he didn't come up as a gangster. He came up as a performing arts student, a pure artist. And um, that's the guy I knew, but I also knew the guy that had severe, um, you know, issues with the father not being there and the severe issues with uh, displacement issues as well, because his mother, they moved a lot. So when you have that, when you have issues of displacement like that, you learn to become a chameleon and fit in quite quickly. Um, it's part of, part of one of your coping mechanisms. I'm sorry, excuse me. Um, and you couple that with being an artist and, and a great storyteller, and you see why it became what it became. Well, it's such a captivating look at Tupac and his mother. Uh, congratulations on this. Good luck at the upcoming Emmys. Dear Mama is currently streaming on Hulu, and thanks for joining Gold Derby today. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Welcome to Gold Derby. I'm senior editor Denton Davidson here with Mary McCartney, director of If These Walls Could Sing, the untold story of the Abbey Road studio featuring all-star interviews and intimate access to the premises. What's so special about Abbey Road Studios? Why did so many artists, including your father, Paul McCartney, see it as the best place to record music? I think, well, I mean, I hadn't realized that it had opened 90 years before it opened in 1931. I think I would have if someone had sort of quizzed me, I would have said it opened in like 1961 or something. So I think it's its longevity and also it's the fact that it has classical music, rock and pop music. Um, there's so many different styles of music 
also it sort of um you can sort of track the history of recording the recording industry and and so it's sort of got so many elements to it um it's really british as well it's in the center of london so it's just got so much to it and i think in the documentary i mean when i was asked to direct the documentary i didn't know a lot of the sort of more historical points beats throughout the history of the of the abbey road studios so um I think that's the thing. I think it's sort of the surprising element. It sort of encompasses so many people. And it it means so much to so many people. People make the pilgrimage to go there because it means so much to them. What was that call for you to make this film? And what inspired you to do this where your dad recorded so much music and you have so many personal memories there? What was that calling for you to, to make this film? Uh, it's somewhere that I've grown up going to I mean as a child going into the studio to visit my parents recording but then you know I was working as a music researcher and I would go and visit people more through work so I got to know the people that actually work at Abbey Road Studios and they became my real friends and I could see the real family atmosphere there um, so there's that but you know really it's that feeling when you go in through the front door it's like a residential building that's been converted in 1931 converted you know the back garden had these huge studios made so it's sort of this you know you think you're walking into a house and then it's this re little recording studio well a big recording studio um but i think that's the thing it's sort of it you still get that feeling when you walk through the door i get i definitely do it's sort of this sort of feeling of something special there's some sort of magic in the walls there, which is why it's called If These Walls Could Sing. But, you know, in asking the people, when I when I was directing it, I hadn't had any, nobody had agreed to be in, you know, to be interviewed. And I was like, if they, if, you know, Elton John doesn't agree or my dad doesn't agree or Oasis, then I don't really have a documentary if I, if the artists don't agree to be interviewed. But they instantly jumped at it because I think coming back there, I could see, and, and when you watch it, you can really see that people are excited when they're there. It's sort of, there's something magical about the place. And in making the documentary, um, because it is a, a busy working studio, it's not open to the public. Uh, I think it was my opportunity, sort of my family growing up there, knowing the people that work there and loving them, just thinking the people that come there and have their picture taken on the zebra crossing are now you know, invited in, it, it shows you, I think, why it's, it's, it's in so many people globally know the name Abbey Road Studios. I think I've, I've, you know, my aim was to go some way to explain why is it that we all, we all do. There's so many great moments. Um, one of the scenes you're speaking with Elton John and he's talking about just meeting your father. Those are the moments we don't get to see if documentaries don't like this don't come out. I mean, that's just so cool to see these two icons that, you know, were coming to know each other at that time. What was it like for you to sit down with and hear these stories, not just as a filmmaker, but to hear the story about your dad? I mean, what were you learning these things along with us? And what what was that like for you? I was completely learning it all um, with the viewer. And again, I think that's why. I'm really pleased that I did take on the project because I have to admit it was quite daunting. Um, you know, for a while when I was learning the history, I kind of went down with my story producer and we wrote down the timeline and all the people that have recorded there over the 90 years. And, and there was a point where I was like, how am I going to make this into a cohesive documentary that is not going to feel like a history lesson? and is gonna, I really wanted it to have emotion and because I love the place and the people I interviewed love the place so much, I kind of wanted to portray that emotion. Cause you know, there are lots of facts, but you know, after half an hour, you kind of switch off. So what, I mean, my background, this is my, the first documentary I've directed, but my background is 25 years of portrait photography. So, it really came in really, really useful. Um, I was, I kind of approached it like I would a photo shoot. I kind of built this, I, I used Abbey Road as much as possible as my location, but, um, and then I used, um, I used props 
from the studio, like things that like, Abbey Road has instruments and tape machines just sort of lying around in the hallway. So I brought them in, put them into the background, had the microphones put in. So, you know, visually there's something to look at, but then just quite a nice soft lighting so that my subject, um, when they were talking to me, it was very conversational. It didn't feel, I didn't want it to be like interview talking heads. I wanted it to be um, like a family feeling to it really casual so it does feel like you're being invited in that was that was the atmosphere that i went for and as a huge music so, fan so answer to your question elton john came in and he gave like one of the best interviews because he came in i'd done you know i'd got it really ready for him so when he came in and he was in there he was like oh my goodness being back in here and you know i was i had a really good set of questions ready for him so you know, it, I was able to prompt memories because it's a very long time ago. So in a way, you kind of, as an interviewer as well, you need to, to go through questions sort of to jog people's memories. And we had like the recording session sheets that we could show him. So, you know, so it, it sort of made it um, a, an interesting interview. I wanted it to be interesting for him to do the interview, not just like the usual questions that he, you know, something that he would enjoy. And then I think, that comes across to the viewer, hopefully. And as a music fan myself, when I think of this studio, I, I just think of all the the famous pop stars that must have gone through there and recorded there. But one of my other favorite interviews was with John Williams, and and hearing about the film scores, I didn't think about that. You know, Indiana <laughs> Jones and Star Wars. What these iconic film scores were recorded there and that meant a lot for the studio at the time correct you know what did what did that business bring to the studio and and how did that change things i mean that kind of in a way it it saved the studio it was a, it was a seminal moment because um a lot of the classical recordings which were done in studio one which is the really huge one for orchestras they'd all kind of been done and they'd all been redone for cds so people weren't really orchestras were not booking the space regularly anymore and there were letters and plans to sort of carve it up make it into a small studio make it into a car park so um luckily the manager um, Ken Townsend heard that there was a studio in Denham that was closing down and he said you know he made a deal to bring the movies to Studio One but they weren't prepared for it you know you have to have like a, a window through from the control room and you have to have the screen so you can project while you're doing so it was all kind of this quite exciting time where they were sort of putting it together but then one of the first films in as you say was uh, Indiana Jones like before Indiana Jones was Indiana Jones and George Lucas and John Williams came over. But John Williams' interview was just the most beautiful, eloquent, heartfelt moment. And it was such a strong interview that I could sort of hang, between him and George Lucas, I could hang the whole section in the documentary about um, the film scores on those two interviews with that and archive. So, you know. It was it was a very important interview for me. And, you know, he just I haven't heard anybody speak so beautifully about a recording space. He really brought it alive. Yeah. If these walls could sing, why why that title? Well, that was actually the title when I was asked to direct it and I, I liked it. So we kept it. But it's that idea. Giles Martin says it in the um in the when I interview him and he's like it's a bit like a teapot like in Britain when you have afternoon tea you're not meant to like rinse out a teapot you sort of just swirl it out and then sort of it builds up and it builds up and you know the flavor and character you know it grows as as you kind of use it more so if these walls could sing is literally what would these walls say in the 90 years they've had so many different artists come through the doors but each one has um, really utilized it and, and it's shone. But again, it's because the people working there, they're dedicated to, um, to just doing, you know, within those four walls, everyone's dedicated to do the best they can. Well, it's a beautiful documentary. Congratulations on the film. Best of luck to you at the upcoming Emmys. If These Walls Could Sing is currently streaming on Hulu and Disney Plus. Thank you for joining Gold Derby today. Thank you.
Welcome to Gold Derby. I'm senior editor Denton Davidson here with Davina Pardo and Leah Wolchuk, directors of Judy Bloom Forever, a look at the famous author's life, impact on pop culture, and the occasional controversies over her frankness about puberty and sex. Judy Bloom, she's one of these iconic authors. She's in a rare league of writers who are also celebrities in their own right. And she's known for her frank talk about sex. And the film kicks right off with her talking about masturbation. Why not? Um, so why did you open with that with that scene and start there? Well, we were looking for, we, we realized at some point, you know, we, we tried different things. We at one point tried opening with letters that children had sent to Judy because we knew the letters were an important part of the film, but that wasn't quite working. We knew we needed to start with Judy's work. We needed to set the tone. We needed to give people who weren't familiar with her work, which is you know, a smaller percentage of the audience, but still wanted to give people a sense of what her work was about. And we wanted to give a sense of her personality. And we felt like that moment captured so much about what the work was, her honesty, how she was radical, unafraid, and also just the way she sort of played to camera and jokes around felt like was the perfect it was the perfect way to open i think we also wanted her to say masturbation right when the film started <laughs> because we wanted people to sort of assess what was happening what the, an audience member might be happening within their own bodies when they hear that word is it making me uncomfortable and why is it making me uncomfortable and why is that woman on screen not uncomfortable while she's saying it and so it was like from the start we know here's someone who's going to tell it like it is and she's not afraid to say anything and I'm gonna relax and listen to her tell her story. And I was familiar with some of her books and she's got so much energy and this great personality that people love, but I really didn't know much about her life at all. Why did she decide that she would allow you in this way? And how did you get connected with her to, to get access to, to her story? Well, it took a couple of years for her to decide she was ready. Um, I first reached out just by sending an email, you know, I know so many kids wrote to her when they were little, but I, I never did. I've been a huge Judy Bloom reader and then sort of came back to it as an adult and realized I wanted to make this film. So I sent an email to her. And a few weeks later, I was actually in the children's section of a bookstore with my kids and looked at my phone and, and there was that first reply, which basically said, no, I don't think so, but maybe. And so we kind of went back and forth for a couple of years. I started building a team. Um, Finally got to meet Judy for the first time. And finally in February, 2020, she decided she was ready. So you know and what happens next. Leah, you were brought on board. I understand that you'd never even read her books. Is that correct? I mean, I read Freckle Juice. Okay. <laughs> but I grew up in Jacksonville, Florida, a place that is now ground zero for the you know resurgence of book banning. And it was then, I mean, Judy's books were seen as taboo. They were seen as inappropriate just like girls' bodies were seen as taboo and strangely inappropriate to even talk about puberty. Same conversations that are happening right now in Florida. Um, so I, I wasn't the fangirl. I didn't have this deep childhood connection. I feel like there's this um, club that I'm not a part of, of all these women of my generation who read Judy's work as kids and felt so deeply connected to her and felt like she understood them in a way and, and opened them up to different experiences. So I didn't have that. And I um, I was really grateful. Davina still asked me to direct the film with her. I think it helps that I had a different perspective that I was looking at her work as an adult and as a mom myself and introducing my own kids in 2020 and 2021 to her work for the first time. So um, I was sort of in part making the film for the kid I wish I had been had I been able to read her books. We, while you were filming, we weren't, I mean, it, it had begun, but it's not like it is now. I mean, we're, did you have any idea how relevant it could have become? I, we are at the point where people are banning books just for talking about race or sexuality. Some people don't want people to know basic American history in their libraries. Um, did that surprise you how relevant this story has now become? We... I mean, we knew that that Judy's experience being censored was going to be sort of this historical chapter of the film. And we were following what was happening in book banning. We knew books were still being banned. And we knew that most of the authors being targeted were black and brown authors and queer authors. So we, we knew that we wanted to interview 
people who write for kids today whose books are being challenged, but we had no idea how things would explode over, you know, over the course of making the film. It went to a place that we, we couldn't have predicted. And Leah, how did you decide who you wanted to interview for this film? Because we see people she wrote letters to, we see celebrities, uh, Molly Ringwald's in there, which I think is the perfect celebrity of an 80s film star to, to be in this uh, in this documentary. Uh, how did you decide on who you wanted to interview? Well, first we thought of everyone that we wanted to interview as a reader. So we wanted to sort of democratize the playing field in a way by considering that they all sat in front of a book, words on a page, and had that intimate experience with Judy as an author. Um, but we wanted to interview, like Davina said, authors who are writing for young audiences whose work is being censored today. We wanted to interview creators of TV shows and movies that are sort of pushing the boundaries of, you know, sex positivity and body positivity on screen. So Anna Conkle, Pen15, Lena Dunham from Girls, and yeah, Molly Ringwald. It's something that was in her interview that we wish we could have put in the film, just that connection that she has with women who saw her saw themselves in her when you know she was a teen icon of the 80s just in the same way that women who approach judy now saw themselves in her books when they were kids reading her books um, but we also always knew that we had to include women who had written to judy as kids and who have continued that relationship with judy for decades it was something that felt extraordinary that Judy has had this deep connection to some of the fans that wrote, reached out to her, not just sending her fan mail, but sending her, pouring their hearts out to her, reaching out to her in really vulnerable moments in their lives and leaning on her in a way that they didn't feel like they could lean on any other adult in their lives. Um, so we were so lucky that Judy introduced us to two women who started writing to her when they were kids and have continued that relationship with her. Yeah, that was one of the most fascinating moments for me was to see that she had re responded to some of these thousands of letters and then maintained a correspondence. She even attended one of their graduations when their parents couldn't attend. I mean, that's shocking. What's um, another thing that surprised me about Judy is that she said she had total recall from basically her entire life since third grade. I barely remember last week. That's what, what fascinated uh, you, Davina, the most about Judy? And what did you learn about her that you didn't expect? And that total recall is incredible. I remember when we went to her, her childhood home in New Jersey, we went into her bedroom and she looked out the window and pointed at each house down the block and said the first and last name of every person who lived in those houses when she was growing up. It's amazing. I didn't know much about her life at all going into this, which is part of why I wanted to make the film. And one of the things that surprised me was that although I knew her work was so radical I didn't know how radical she was I mean I get and I guess that seemed I mean of course she, of course of, of course the person who created that work would be radical but I didn't realize like to the extent to which it it came out over the course of her life and her personal life that she was constantly pushing back against societal expectations in her marriage in finding her voice as a writer in writing books that were considered taboo in leaving a second marriage and, you know, disappointing her mother in, and then in fighting the censors. And, you know, that scene with Pat Buchanan going head to head with Pat Buchanan in this like really quiet, calm, but brilliant way, just finding the perfect way to, to fight back. Yeah, I love that scene with Pat Buchanan where she asks him, you know, why is she why is he so wrapped up about masturbation? <laughs> and um, and she says in the film that, you know, she she felt she didn't feel brave. She felt brave in her writing, but she didn't feel brave to be a spokesperson. But she really uh, it didn't really seem that way. I mean, she was out on television doing things that uh, I think many people would not have had the, the bravery to do. Um, Davina and Leah, best of luck to you at the Emmys. Judy Bloom Forever is currently streaming on Amazon Prime Video. And I want to thank you both for joining Gold Derby today. Thanks for having us. Welcome to Gold Derby. I'm senior editor Denton Davidson here with Oscar winner Davis Guggenheim, director of Still, a Michael J. Fox movie, which explores the actor's personal and professional triumphs and travails and what happens when an incurable optimist confronts an incurable disease. 
Davis, what was your connection to Michael J. Fox and how was this project brought to you or did you seek it out? What made you want to tell this story? Yeah, it was it was during COVID and I was very blue. You might even say I was depressed. And I felt like I was in a personal rut and a professional rut. I felt like I've been making the same thing over and over again. And uh, and I was looking for some some like joy in my work. And I read this interview with Michael where he had this, uh, it, was, it, was a, it was a conversation about his most recent book and his writing was so good. The storytelling was so good, but also there was a, a humor, a surprising humor and wisdom in his book. And I, and I, was like, I, I started to read it for myself. And as I read his books, then I listened to his books on tape. I was like, oh my God, this would be an amazing movie. I never thought I was, would direct it, but I was like, and then suddenly there were elements in his books that were just undeniably great. And it really is his story. He's the subject, he's the really the only one you interview. There aren't guest interviews or people talking about him. He's telling the story. Why did you opt to sort of allow him to say everything um, and then really brilliantly weave in these clips from Family Ties and all of his movies to, to tell the story as if we're watching it unfold, almost like a narrative. It, I mean, it's it's genius the way it's edited together. Thank you. I, my my instinct when I pitched it to Apple TV Plus, uh, I said I want I, I want to make it a movie that feels like a, a wild ride, like like a Michael J. Fox movie from the '80s, uh, with the color and the music, big music, big score. And I wasn't going to do any interviews. Uh, and then last minute, I just said, let me just try one interview, like a really intimate single shot close up of him to see what that would be like. And he was so su surprisingly funny and, and poignant that I did more and more of that. So we interviewed that, that one shot we did like seven different times over the course of a two year production. And he also doesn't care. I mean, he's very open about what he's going through in life. He's got a black eye. He crashed in and broke his, his cheek. A few weeks prior, we see him fall on the sidewalk in early on in the in the film. He's very open about uh, the struggles that he's having. Is that, you know, what was that like just being around him and, and filming that? You know, with every documentary, you wonder, you know, is is this person going to let you in? And what are they what do they not want to talk about? And what are they hiding or what are they hiding is too strong a word. But what are they what are they avoiding? Right. And um Michael was, I've never encountered anything like this. Michael was a completely open book. Maybe it's his Parkinson's, but it was, it's like the timing was, at, he's at a point in his life where he's got nothing to hide. And, uh, and, and the other thing is, you know, that when he, you mentioned that fall, I think the one thing he didn't want is to be perceived as someone who is, you know, um, with a disability or someone with a disease and he didn't want to be seen as someone pitied, you know, or, or even noble and heroic. He wanted to be seen as, you know, that, that irreverent, puckish, funny, and sometimes wise character. He also does not miss a beat. I mean, he falls and some lady's like, are you okay? And he's like, oh yeah, nice to meet you. You knocked me off my feet. I mean, his, his humor is, is right there. Um, I also love the parts where you don't interview his family, but we see him with his family and his kids are teasing him about his weird text messages that he sends them like days after responding. Uh, what was it like just to be around him and his family and see that dynamic? Because they're, it, it's funny to see them all together. Well, for a family that's like in the public eye and, you know, a Hollywood family, if that's what you would call it, they actually live in, in New York, but they're so normal and so loving that, and, and I think Tracy and Michael make a, a big deal not to pull their children into that. They're, it just, they're just, they wanna be regular people. And that scene is really quite funny because Michael starts by saying, we, we cut this in, he's like, I don't, you know, if my family ever said, oh, poor you, you know, let me take care of you. He's like, that'd be the worst thing in the world. I, I don't wanna be treated any differently. And so the scene is, he's, 
he's texting, he's trying to text his daughter. They talk about how he doesn't text very well. And, and uh, it could easily be my family making fun of me and, you know, like making fun of the dad being that awkward, you know, dad who never gets anything right. And it, it's, like, it's, it's, it's very, very, um, very appealing and very funny. It is. Um, one of the things I just really want to highlight, again, maybe a little bit more in depth is the way that the story is told, it's not like most documentaries that I've seen. Some of it is uh, like stuff that you've appeared to film. And then other things are clips like we've spoken about before from his TV shows and films. How much footage are you combing through? I mean, that had to, I feel like that would have taken forever to find exact, like you talk about his marriage to Tracy and then you find the perfect moment from family ties of them interacting in a scene that tells the story that he's telling but it's completely out of context, but you wouldn't know it by what you're seeing. Talk about that process and your editor, Michael Hart, and what he was able to pull off. Yeah, so I definitely had this instinct to, 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 to push the form. Like I said, I was sort of in a rut and I was like, well, let's see how far we can go. And because this is a quintessentially 80s story, let's, let's be brash about it. Let's, let's do anything we can, let's, let's try things. And my instinct was always to, do recreations and you know and and uh, um and we filmed a lot of them up in Vancouver uh and um but Michael Hart the editor who's a just a movie fanatic and a Michael J Fox fanatic uh, would start to cut these scenes from different movies as scenes from his own life and like one example there's so many many examples but one example is you know Michael and Tracy are both actors on this movie, Bright Lights, Big City. And the scene is them on a date and they're walking in the streets of New York and Greenwich Village. Um, and, um, and, and in real life, they're dating and falling in love. But the scene is them dating and falling in love. Uh, and he's the biggest movie star in the world at that point. And her character says, oh, I guess I'm supposed to be super impressed by your job. <laughs> And it could be the character talking to the character, or it could be Tracy talking to Michael, because he's I mean, part of that scene is him. Part of that moment is him going through um, this moment where he's being treated very differently, and he's a bit lost. Uh, but there they are walking in the street. It ends up with them having their first kiss, and the genius beh behind what Michael Hart did was to make that feel like their very first date, and with the music and with the cutting and with the scenes before you kind of go with it. You know, you take this leap that it's actually happening in front of your eyes. What was the most surprising thing you learned about Michael J. Fox through this process? You know, I, th I, think, I think sometimes, I I'm guilty of this. Sometimes we think that someone who is funny is not particularly deep. The funny guy is, is um, quick with a joke, you know, skipping on the surface of life. And I think when you see this movie and you meet him, you realize that there's a depth to him that a lot of us didn't acknowledge. And, and on top of that, a wisdom that has come with this incredible thing that happened to him. I mean, he's the biggest movie star in the world. And then he gets this diagnosis at 29 and he, he does all the wrong things before he does the right things. I don't want to give too much away, but through that process, through that him getting lost in the wilderness, he finds something. And in that there's a wisdom that he has for us. And a lot of poking fun at himself and his height. And uh, you also tell a, the very interesting story of before he made it. I mean, getting to California with his father and then just how much he struggled before I mean, he, he was talking about selling his sofa off piece by piece. Uh, what were some of those stories like for you to hear? Well, he also talked about um, going to IHOP and getting the little packets of jam, the Smucker's iPack. Yeah. <laughs> and I go, why? He goes, to eat. <laughs> he was, it's, it's amazing. The story is kind of remarkable. He drops out of high school. He's like 17. He looks... 10 and that's why he goes to Hollywood because casting directors think well if you look 10 you can play kids 
and have an advantage over the actors who are 10, you know, who can't work longer hours. And his dad's this real tough guy in the, you know, who was in the army. And he convinces his dad to drive him down to Hollywood uh, in their Aspen, in their Dodge Aspen, you know. And, uh, and it's a rocky, it's a very rocky start for him. And he almost moves back. You know, he's running out of money. He talks about having, that he's gonna have to walk to the airport to fly home and work construction for his brother. But he has one last audition and that's for Family Ties. Wow. Well, it's such an insightful film and it, it was so great to see. Davis, congratulations on this. Best of luck to you at the Emmys. Still a Michael J. Fox movie is available to stream on Apple TV Plus. And thanks for joining Gold Derby today. Thank you. Welcome to Gold Derby. I'm senior editor Denton Davidson here with Ryan White, director of Pamela, A Love Story, which follows the life of pop culture icon Pamela Anderson, including never before seen archival footage and personal journals. Ryan, you haven't done a lot of celebrity spotlights. You've been involved in many serious topics. Pamela Anderson, as this documentary points out, was not taken seriously. She was, she's been the focus of a lot of media ridicule and jokes for decades. How did you become involved in this story and what made you interested in telling it? Well, the honest an answer is when it immediately came to me, I got a phone call saying, would you be interested in a Pamela Anderson documentary? I said, no, thank you right away. And I think I'm guilty just as many of having those preconceived notions of who, who Pamela Anderson was. I mean, I was a, I was a teenager in the nineties. So Pamela to me is like the most famous person in the world as I'm as I'm coming of age. And then she just sort of disappeared out of my consciousness once I became an adult. I, I didn't even know Pamela Anderson was Canadian um, when I began this film. So I was truly starting at square zero. So I said, no, thank you. But uh, my sales agent, Josh Braun, convinced me to have a lunch with Pamela's son, Brandon, um, who I also had all these preconceived notions of as a 25 year old Hollywood kid that's the child of Pamela Anderson and Tommy Lee I I think I thought um, he would be one thing but I agreed to have lunch with him and at that lunch everything that he told me about his mom and especially his relationship with his mom um, surprised me in a way that started to unravel a lot of those preconceived notions but I expressed my wariness to him saying like I just don't think I'm the right fit and Brandon basically just begged me he said please just get on a Zoom with my mom who, who lives in Vancouver Island. And he said, like, I think you guys are going to find each other really funny is the expression that he used. And I was intrigued. So uh, the next day uh, in this very kitchen, Pamela Anderson popped up in a little square from her boathouse in Canada. And it was a two and a half hour conversation. Um, and she surprised me in like all the best of ways. And and mostly in the way that she was not interested in the documentary process. Like from the very beginning, she was not asking questions in a way that to me, often when I'm asked to make a celebrity doc, the celebrity or especially the team around the celebrity um, wants to establish from the very first conversations, Pamela wasn't asking about the documentary at all. She just wanted to get to know each other. Um, and she invited me up and that was, that was the beginning of the film and it was just a a process of continually um being surprised by this woman and she's an open book she's not interested in holding back her opinions she's also not interested in the glam squad she couldn't feel further away from hollywood when you when you watch this did it feel important for her to show that side of herself and were you surprised when uh, that she wasn't concerned about how she looked i mean she looks great but she she wasn't paranoid like she didn't need all the makeup and and the hair done yeah i mean she's she's a larger than life character like you said in your intro she's a cultural icon she's famous for how she looks and so uh because of that i assumed that it would be a very involved process at that original lunch with brandon i even remember saying like well if your mom lives on an island like how do we even do hair and makeup. That just sounds logistically tough. And he he burst into laughter and he was like, oh, no, 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 my mom does not get hair and makeup done. Even when she does her photo shoots, she does her own hair and makeup. She's always in control of that. Uh, and so that's just ingrained in her. That wasn't something I think uh, she was trying to do the cameras. And linked to that, I think, is, is her being an open book. I mean, I would 
I think all the filmmakers on this panel would probably say like trust is the most important thing, especially when you're working with a singular documentary subject or a couple of them uh, is building that trust. And I would love to amp up this, you know, months long period that I had to valiantly win the trust of Pamela Anderson to get her to open up to me. But that would be that would be melodramatic because the truth is Pamela is an open book by nature. I watch her day to day do that with everyone around her. Um, I think it's one of the really special things that makes Pamela really endearing, like no matter um, how much she's been you know, chewed up and spit out by us, society, the media. Um, she still is not willing to lose that vulnerability and that that trust in human beings. And so she was like that from the very beginning on that first Zoom. She said, I'll talk about anything. I, I have nothing to hide. She always says, I've never killed anyone that I know of. Um, and I have no I have no skeletons in my closet that I'm that embarrassed of. And to get to work with a celebrity of her magnitude um, that that um, unashamed of every aspect of their life, um, Pamela, I think, truly has no regrets, even the mistakes that she's made throughout her life. And so she likes to own those mistakes and those accidents that she made. And so that was the that was the groundwork from the beginning was she was saying, ask me anything. And she honored that there was not one time where she ever said, I don't want to talk about that, Ryan. Um, you know, there were uncomfortable times for sure. And we include them, a lot of them in the film, but she never, she never asked, uh, she never asked me to, 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 to change the subject. One of the things that struck me after watching it and seeing people discuss it on social media was everyone seemed shocked by how much they liked the movie and sort of fell in love with her. I mean, I think there was this expectation like, uh, like Pamela Anderson, and there's this it really comes across how relatable she was. And I think people had a, a completely new respect for who she was and what she went through that I don't think they appreciated in the 90s and, and wasn't really brought to the forefront. That had to feel good for you and, and hopefully her as well. Did, has, have you heard from her about that response at all? Yeah, I mean, Pamela's not someone, she never, she never was interested in the documentary process. She never watched the documentary. As you know, like we used all of her archival footage, every diary that she's ever written from her entire life, going back to when she was a little kid, you know, is in my, is in my closet right now. She just handed them all over and had no idea how we were going to use them, just gave us, gave us carte blanche. So she was never someone, and this is what endeared me to her, she was never someone who was really interested in how the documentary documentary would be perceived or how it might you know change her perception amongst an audience it's not really how the pamela anderson brain works but that being said when we released the film in january and february and i got to be on the road with her for a few weeks and watch people react to her especially after we had a screening of the film get to watch an audience as she went on stage or uh, she did a Q&A. You could see it in her eyes, how surprised. And I, by the way, I saw this in Chicago too, when she did her performance um, in Chicago at the end of my film, which was right after, you know, the Hulu series came out. And so it really was redemptive for Pamela to get that role in Chicago, because like you said, she's been, she's been discounted her entire life. She's been kind of a punchline. Uh, so watching her in Chicago, and then especially watching when our film came out and getting to watch, I would just kind of watch her out of the side of my eye as an audience applauded. And to get to see that kind of pride in her that she would never say this, she still would never say this, but like getting to see her not be treated as a punchline, um, but to get to watch an audience just receive her in a way where they're really happy to be in her presence. I found, I found really rewarding as someone who got to know her really well over the last few years. It was a fun way to end the, the the film. Did you know that you were gonna end it there? Or how did you just, how do you know when to end a documentary? I don't think you ever, I think you ever know. My my first film school professor called it musical chairs. And she would say like, so at some point the music has to stop and you just find your, find your chair. But I had to embrace from the very beginning. I thought we had this perfect story arc. You know, when I met Brandon and Pamela at the beginning, like, oh, I didn't even know Pamela Anderson was Canadian, much less that she's returned to this small town on an island. What beautiful bookends. And she had this crazy life in between. But now she's married to a local and 
She lives on her grandma's land. I thought that was the arc of the film. Now I know Pamela Anderson very well, and I know there are no predictable arcs in her life. Everything gets blown up with no, no notice. So from the very first shoot, even the mere fact of us being there and forcing her to go through her memories, it was already unsettling her current marriage, which ended up being her fifth divorce while we were making the film. We didn't even know that the Hulu series was coming when we began this documentary. So that wasn't uh, a glimmer in my eye, nor Pamela's. Um, and we had no idea that she would leave the island and go to New York to play play Roxy Hart in Chicago. So um, it was an unpredictable film. It was a fun film to make in that way because uh, Pamela is so impulsive and spontaneous. It was very run and gun. Like it was often just me with a camera jumping in a red pickup with Pamela and her assistant on a road trip from Canada to wherever, you know, when the Hulu series came out, she hid away in, uh, in Vegas in her ex-husband Rick Solomon's house and we road trip down there um, from Canada. So she's a true free spirit in that way. And it was, it was really fun. I had to, I had to be okay with completely, you know, blowing up whatever my plan or my cruise, cruise plans were and just always being nimble because you you never know what, what Pamela is going to do next. Well, it was fun to see that other side of her. Congratulations on this film. Best of luck to you at the upcoming Emmys. Pamela, a love story is currently streaming on Netflix. And thank you, Ryan, for joining Gold Derby today. Thank you so much. Welcome to this special Gold Derby Meet the Experts TV documentary panel. I'm senior editor Denton Davidson, joined by directors Alan Hughes for Dear Mama, Mary McCartney for If These Walls Could Sing, Davina Pardo and Leah Wolchuk for Judy Bloom Forever, Davis Guggenheim for Still, a Michael J. Fox movie, and Ryan White from Pamela, a love story. You're all accomplished filmmakers now. This group of films certainly proves that. And I want to just start by asking if you were teaching a film study course, which is one film you would have your students watch, and why? Let's start with Davis. Oh, um, well, we have, a, um, we have a fellowship program at my company uh, where young filmmakers are sort of like developing. And I've, I've taught, taught, I've, I've shown Man on Wire, uh, James Marsh's film, just because I think it's just a master class in storytelling. And it proves that, um, in nonfiction, narrative can can be just as strong as in, in scripted stuff. And and it's just, but it's also a true documentary. Uh, yeah. and, and I think it, it pushed so many boundaries uh, in terms of what you could use and how you could do recreations and how you could move narrative forward. And it allowed, I think, probably all of us who are on the, on the Zoom today to, to do what we do. Mary, how about you? Does does anything stand out for you? Um, yeah, I mean, whenever I'm asked one of my favorite films, I always think of being there. Um, the Hal Ashby film from the 60s. Um, I know it's not a documentary, but there's something about it that it's still, I actually rewatched it recently and there's an innocence and a charm to it, but it's just so clever. And I think with the world as it is today, everything seems sort of, like everyone's trying so hard and, you know, everything gets so big. Um, but the character in it, Chance, Chance Gardner, is literally just so simple and quiet. And um, he just sort of plods on and it's just so innocent and lovely and, and deep. So, yeah, that's one that always comes to mind. If, if nobody's seen it, I'm always envious that they haven't seen it because it was just, just a joy. Davina, how about you? I couldn't do one, but you know, I've been thinking about those filmmakers who, when you you turn on their film, you know it's theirs. You know those people who have a singular voice. So, I mean, people I've been thinking about lately: Garrett Bradley, Kristen Johnson, Joshua Oppenheimer, Sarah Polly. Those are, and they're all sort of playing playing with the relationship between fact and fiction and truth and storytelling. So that's sort of where I'd start. Leah. Uh, I think if I were teaching a course, I would tell my students to go to a thrift store and or a, a yard sale and get someone's home movies and watch their home movies and see 
how the camera could be like a catalyst for connection or maybe a deterrent to connection. See where people get self-conscious because people always get self-conscious when a camera first enters the scene. Because if you're wanting to make films, you have to be aware of the power of the camera, both for good and not so good. And Ryan, how about you? Uh, I know there was one film when I was a film student that totally changed the trajectory of my life. And when I when I teach, I always I always show it. I, I grew up in Georgia where documentaries were not being shown at the multiplexes. So I wasn't even really aware of documentaries, even though I wanted to be a filmmaker until I was in college and for extra credit, uh, we had to go see a documentary um, in a class, and it was Agnes Varda's The Gleaners and I. Um, and oh, I love that. I'm a massive Agnes Varda fan now, but that was the first film that really blew my, and I don't make films like that, by the way, but it blew my mind open in whatever she was doing in that film to a medium that I didn't even know, uh, didn't even know existed. So it's still one of my all-time favorite documentaries. And each of you has had such different career paths, but you've all found your way into documentary filmmaking. Some of you have done TV shows, scripted film, television, cooking shows. Um, you're all here today with these great TV documentaries we're discussing. What excites you about documentary film? What pulled you into this art form? And uh, especially today, I mean, it's more accessible than ever, the way it's streaming. All of you are connected to streamers uh, with your films in some way and people are, be, are are able to see these documentaries in ways that they certainly weren't in like the 90s when I was growing up. I, it, there were very few documentaries that really broke out. Uh, what brought you into this art form? I'll start with you, Mary. I mean, it was touched on before, but I think, you know, cause my background is photography and when it's it's about meeting someone that you don't know very well, and needing to, to get a lot from them. And in moving into documentary and directing, it's a lot more about teamwork. And so chemistry is the biggest and most important thing. So when you get there and it works and it all comes together and your team or work, you know, cause everyone works really hard, it's long hours um, and you have to be really focused to get all of the, you know, to everything you need to edit something with real meaning together. So it has to be teamwork and chemistry because when that's right, I mean, that's personally why I want to do it again. It's addictive. Ryan, how about you? What pulled you into this? Uh, I mean, a lot of things, but I mean, one of the things I love most about this medium of filmmaking is, and it's very well suited to my personality, at least the types of, of documentaries that I like to make. I'm an awful planner. I'm awful at logistics. All my producers will tell you. Um, and I love the unpredictability. I mean, we were talking about it with Pamela, but uh, that that exists in a lot of my films, these situations that are totally unpredictable. And I love run and gun filmmaking where not a lot of decision and, and planning has to go into it. I love just jumping on a plane with my camera and ending up in a spot and figuring it out uh, with your subjects as you go. Um, and it's always, you know, all my all my my filmography is kind of all over the map, but all of them sort of have that, uh, to me, invigorating sense of unpredictability to them. And I'm very, I'm one of those few people I think is very comfortable um, on that wavelength. And Leo, I hate unpredictability. Oh my god, let's work together. <laughs> uh, freaks me out. Um, I think. I love working in documentary because I like do I, I like working in a field that sort of grows empathy. Um, I, I like what Mary was saying about sort of the intimacy and the connection that the team has to each other when they're working on a film, both like the filmmaking team and the people that are in front of the camera. Um, I I think yeah, I think making films that can inspire people to look outside of themselves and see an entirely different worldview and connect with someone from an entire, entirely different worldview is, is pretty extraordinary. It feels like quite a privilege to be able to do it. Davina? Yeah, I, I started out in photography too. Um, I think a lot of documentary filmmakers have. 
And we've been thinking about sort of what, what happens when you develop an image when you're back when we were in wet dark rooms and that like that alchemy where you sort of know what you're, what you're going to get, but you really don't. And that there's such a magic to it. And I think I found that in documentary filmmaking too. Although that, that magic may happen over five years instead of like a, a couple nights in the dark room, it's, it's still there. And then when that sort of combination of image and storytelling and human relationships comes together in sort of its magical way, there's, there's nothing else like it. And Alan, I'm gonna pull you back in here and I, I have a double part question for you. And it's, if you were teaching a film study course, what film would you make your students watch? And I also am curious, what what pulled you into the art of documentary filmmaking? Uh, because you've you've done both scripted and nonfiction. What do you love about documentary film? Well, I love, I, first and foremost, I'm a big fan of documentary films more than I am of feature scripted because it's, it's real people, real lives, unexpected journeys. Um, and there's still like, this incredible amount of innovation going on in this medium um, that I just don't see happening in feature films. Um, the film I would uh, show is uh, Shirley Clark's 1967 Portrait of Jason, the documentary about the gay burlesque dancing. I don't know what this guy was, but he's an amazing figure, black man. Um, and it goes to what I said earlier about when you find the right character, there's just so much rich story in that journey and it's just one camera one night in a hotel room in new york with this uh incredible transcendent human being um and that's the that's one of my favorite films it happens to be a documentary and davis how about you what what pulled you into documentary film it's funny when when uh, i was moving to la from washington dc in 1988 i drove my volkswagen jetta uh to la and the one thing I knew I was I'm never going to direct documentaries. <laughs> <laughs> my Why? father, my father made documentaries, and he was like my hero. He made all these social justice documentaries, and I was like, I could never be like him. So I'm going to find my own path, and I became this television director. So I just, you know, I did these shows like NYPD Blue and ER, and Alias, and Deadwood, and I and I just lived in the scripted world and. Uh, and then a long story short, I, I, I got fired off a movie and started to make it a documentary about public school teachers. And for the longest time, I, my life is bifurcated between my, the, my documentary work and my scripted work. They're just worlds that didn't know each other and kept them apart. Uh, and this film, I started to use a lot of my, even though it's a documentary, I used a lot of the things I learned and loved about scripted and, and sort of melded it into this. So, um, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of fun. And, and what everyone here is saying is that I think documentaries are such a, it's such a rich time to be working, you know, where, where like scripted stuff seems to be locked in place. Documentaries are sort of, the form is exploding and, the, and you can do almost anything you want. So it's just such a rich, wonderful time to be doing documentaries. And just to bring things to a close, every one of you has such widespread critical acclaim with these films. It's, I mean, it's rare for me to have a, a panel that's so stacked. All of you have like well over 90% on Rotten Tomatoes. Critics can be fickle, you know, sometimes they're a buzzkill, but not for you guys this time around. Um, I would love to hear from each of you a piece of advice that you would wish you had known when you were a young filmmaker, when you were starting out or a horror story that you remember, that that you learned from? Uh, what do you wish you would have known back then that you know now as a filmmaker? Let's start with Ryan. Oh man, I mean, it's a completely different world now than when I actually started in documentary filmmaking where Davis is from in Washington, DC. And they were like two jobs to get in documentary filmmaking when I was graduating in the early, uh, 2000s. And now, I mean, I have a tiny production company compared to a lot of my colleagues, and we probably have 10 people um, in their 20s working for us. So it's a whole different landscape. I mean, I think the challenge now is like, I was forced at some point in my 20s to go out and make my first film because there was no ladder to climb. Uh, and so I directed my first film 
quite young because there was nowhere to go in documentary filmmaking. Now, uh, a lot of the young people that work for us, because there is a ladder to climb, I often see not taking uh, the risks to go out and make their own films the way we did in a very DIY way. So I often say that to a lot of young people that work for me, especially if they have an idea that they love, like, go make it. Like, you, we'll, we'll always be here if you come back. But like, let's figure out how you how you direct your first film instead of spending 20 years climbing the documentary ladder. Leah, how about you? Um, I mean, listen to your gut. There's a lot of noise and a lot of voices, a lot of <laughs> a lot of suggestions, especially um, once you have a rough cut and you're going to get a lot of feedback about what's not working. But there is always a centering. There's a place that you can return to in your gut to figure out what's really important in the story and what's really important to you in your in your life. Maybe it's actually taking a break from documentary for a while and focusing on something else in your life. Davina. I was going to say the same thing. You can tell we've both been spending a lot of time with Judy Bloom lately. <laughs> Learn to listen to our, our inner voices. Um, yeah, I mean, that I mean that's so important. Like, listen, listen to your gut and and figure out what it is that you want to say. Everyone has something to say, and and find your voice and find that story that's really deep inside you. Like that's it doesn't mean it has to be your story about who you are, but figure out what it is that kind of needs to come out. Mary, how about you? Um, I mean, it's similar to what everyone said so far, but it, I think really my, my my younger self in my early 20s, the first time I got a commission, it was like, oh my goodness, I'm going to get found out. I don't really know what I'm doing. And I just threw lots of things at it that really wasn't me or my style because I got insecure. So I didn't do my what instinctively and creatively I wanted to do. I was like, I'm going to overlight it and I'm going to do this. And then it was like, who even did that? That isn't even you. So I think from that one shoot, I was like, just, you know, just plod on as, you know, say just shoot, film things, work with teams, talk to people, get out there and actually do things and learn your own style and build your own confidence. That's that's the main way that, you know, that I think you sort of, you build your own style. And, you know, if you don't go out there, it's not gonna happen. So you just have to take the leap. And Davis. I wish I had learned how to fail sooner. Hmm. That now I realize that like, even when things are going well, that failure is a part of every day. Like you're not, you. the good stuff comes when you try wild ideas and many of those wild ideas suck. <laughs> and so I look back now that I'm almost 60 and I go, God, I wish I had, I wish I was more comfortable with failure in my twenties and thirties. I would have made more stuff. It's sort of, a, it's a muscle. It's a skill that you develop that, you know, and I, um, there's a, a tennis coach I heard talking about, like, he says, I either, I either win or I learn. You know, and I just love the idea of just like be, being comfortable with failure because that's where the good stuff surfaces. And Alan, we'll give you the final word. I wish as storytellers, filmmakers, me personally, I wish I was told that, you know, like documentary films are films. You know, back 20, 30 years ago, they were looked at like the other. And I think that I would tell young storytellers that these are just as important, if not more powerful than most feature films. I wish I would start it in documentaries instead of feature films because it's more nimble. You can experiment a lot more. You can explore rich themes and complex sub themes as well that I don't think you can do in feature filmmaking. Um, so I wish I was, I had known that this may have been the entry point instead of just scripted. Um, it's just a, a lot more. I think documentary filmmaking, if, if, you, if you're doing it correctly, I don't know what that is, it changes you as a, as a human being as well. Then I don't feel scripted uh, does that. And so I wish more young filmmakers would look to uh, a documentary filmmaking as the destination instead of like, I think it's changing though. I think that's changing. I think it's so, so enter entertaining now and so rich. Uh, but I wish 20, 30 years ago, um, me and my brother would have started with these. 
Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, congratulations to all of you. Such an incredible panel of documentary filmmakers, wonderful films that everyone can go check out. Once again, we've had Alan Hughes, Mary McCartney, Davina Pardo, Leah Wolchuk, Davis Guggenheim, and Ryan White. Uh, they're all currently streaming. Uh, we'll have all of that information in our articles and, and stream and comments below. So check that out. Best of luck to all of you at the Emmys and good luck. And thanks for joining Gold Derby today. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so Thank much. You.